Hi, I'm Chris Broyles. I work at the Storm Prediction Center here in Norman, Oklahoma. Over the last three years, I've been working on the Tornado Genesis Project, a team of eight individuals. We've looked at 208 supercells that produced EF3 to EF5 tornadoes. During the project, we developed an animation. The animation shows the storm that moved through Moore, Oklahoma on May 20th, 2013, and produced an EF5 tornado. In this presentation, you're gonna see the radar images of the Moore storm, and then you're gonna see how the storm developed from a cloud into a supercell, and then how the mesocyclone went on to produce the tornado. We're gonna to look at the complete life cycle of the Moore EF5 tornadic supercell. I hope you enjoy the animation. This project is a joint effort between the Storm Prediction Center, National Severe Storms Laboratory, University of Oklahoma, and Weather Prediction Center. Well, often I get asked the question, why did the Moore storm produce such a prolific tornado? And some people tell me that it must have moved along a boundary. If you look at boundary analysis, the cold front there in blue is to the west, the outflow boundary in purple is to the northwest, and the dry line there in brown is to the southwest. And then they have the rear flank downdraft and forward flank downdraft boundaries in white. But the synoptic boundaries are all to the west of the Moore storm, so the answer is no, it did not track along the boundary. So why Moore? There were half a dozen storms between the Red River and north central Oklahoma, and the storms around Moore the Moore storm did not do anything. Um, they, re they weren't even really severe weather producers that much. Uh, so why did Moore produce a historic tornado, high-end tornado? Well, if we look at in detail, the Moore storm is uh, the, the big uh, storm with the red reflectivity there, and it's in a rapidly developing stage. But if you look to the southwest in the bottom left hand corner of the picture, uh, there's a, a storm that is developing, uh, kind of isolated, but it's moving toward the Moore storm. And it's approaching the Moore um, pendant there, uh, the developing hook echo, uh, but it is not a producing a tornado. Um, this is about nine minutes before the tornado. And this is the storm that's associated with what would become DRC2 the descending reflectivity core as it approached um, the mesocyclone would um, go around the circulation. Uh, and this is the storm here that's associated with that one. It would be the second descending reflectivity core that would impact the Moore storm. But we're gonna look at this storm in more detail and we're gonna look at vice velocity and look at some of the winds within it. But it merged, it became a descending reflectivity core right there we're going to call it just the DRC, DRC2, and then merged in with the tornado that was ongoing. But notice there's another storm out down to the south-southwest, uh, isolated as well, and we're going to take a look at that one as well. But first we're going to look at the, uh, the storm that was associated with DRC2. There's the base velocity returns. If you use a, um, the GR... Uh, level two radar software and, uh, and just go to estimated wind speeds. The estimated inbound wind speeds were 60 to 75 knots, right around 700 millibars. And so that feature just merged into the mesocyclone. And the question is, was that something more or was it just a, a related to the convection that was uh, approaching the more updraft? Now let's uh, also take a look further south, southwest at this storm that's south-southwest of the Moore storm in the lower part of your picture. That one there, it took a track that was very similar to the one, the storm that was associated with the ERC-2. So we're gonna look at the base velocity winds inside that and compare it to the, the wind speeds that we found with uh, the storm associated with the ERC-2. So over on the right, we have uh, 60 to 75 knot winds associated with the storm that would become DRC2. And then the one here, uh, the lower one on the lower left, the, the winds are estimated to be 45 to 50 knots, which is in agreement with the 17Z sounding, which had the background winds of about 50 knots. So why were the winds 
uh, in the storm that so was associated with DRC2, so much stronger. The flow was anywhere from 20, uh, about 20 knots stronger on average. And so why? The storms took the same track, uh, uh, similar tracks, not exact, but similar. So was there something uh, associated with the storm that emerged into the more updraft? Was there something uh, a little bit larger in scale? And so we're going to look at a cross section here along the track of the storm that would become DRC2. And so here is the storm. This storm was associated with DRC2, the one right in the middle of the cross section here. The Moore supercell is over here on the right. Now watch what happens when this, uh, this uh, becomes a DR, uh, DRC. So it just kind of stretches out and then merges into the more updraft. So if we look at the base velocity cross section, so we're looking at the winds here of this approaching convection. Now, is this a larger scale feature like uh, the nose of an approaching jet? There were high wind speeds within this uh, convective updraft. Of, like I, uh, we had measured um, anywhere from about 60 to 80 knots, 65 to 80 knots. And so this feature uh, approaches the more mesocycling, which is what we see over here on the right. And at this point, it looks like uh, it's about nine minutes before the tornado, but it looks like it's definitely impacting the more updraft. And you can see that the winds uh, down below 10,000 feet here, the blues, it's impacting the low level mesocyclone here. And the low level meso is really, it's really strengthened as this feature uh, merged in. And also too, um, there's, there appears to be downward mixing occurring with the convection. So not only do you have potentially a larger scale feature because we see winds of 65 to 75 knots estimated back uh, uh, well behind this uh, convection that was associated with the DRC. So it looks like there was stronger flow going well back behind this convection. But this convection was mixing down winds. It looks like they were estimated about 55 to 60 knots around 4,000 feet, which is about 850 millibars. And so if we look at the, the reflectivity there, you can see there's the, the storm that was associated with the DRC. And so you notice how the base velocity winds do, there's an angle downward. And so you can see the winds increase as you go down from where that convection is. It's just very really well lined up. So there's definitely a mix in there. But notice below 10, this, this area, the, the lower, uh, two lines, the surface is the bottom line and the second line up is 10,000 feet. So the blues extend well below 10,000 feet. Now if we go back, um, see how this, this, this area of blue high wind, high wind speeds continues to, to it looks like it'd be, it's associated with the uh, Moore storm now. And then it, it's still blue down below 10,000 feet, so the higher wind speeds. But then the winds become light all of a sudden and uh, winds went back to what was evident on the 17th desounding, which was about 50 knots. So it went from about 80 knots, about 70 to 70 to 75, 80 knots at the, at the highest. Uh, then all of a sudden within just two scans, it drops suddenly down to 50 knots. And so the thinking is, is that there was a, a jet structure passing through the flow from southwest to northeast. And this is 2021. This is toward the end of the tornado, uh, just after uh, the tornado had reached max intensity. Uh, and then this jet passes. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at some more cross sections to see if we can see anything else. Here's a cross section looking north, northwest. And this is at the beginning of the tornado. This is actually about f five minutes before the tornado. This is actually, but we're going to look at the cross section as the storm comes through the cross section. So we see the more meso over here to the right. And so this is a, about 17 and a half minutes before the tornado. And so we see the, the higher wind speeds associated with that feature that we saw on the cross section. Is that the nose of a jet? And then look at the next scan here. Uh, the, the winds just really increase through a broad layer. Uh, we also see this is associated with the convection that was approaching. But it's, the question is, is this a, a larger scale feature? And I think it is. And I'm going to show even more evidence. But this, uh, this area of higher winds 
then merges with the more updraft. And this is 30 seconds before the tornado. So you can see it did impact the tornado. We had it estimated of impacting the more updraft at about 42, 42, 1942Z. We're gonna look at another cross section. This is toward the end of the uh, tornado's life cycle. We're looking north, northwest again, uh, almost more of a northwesterly direction there behind. It's gonna be, the tornado's gonna pass through uh, and we're gonna see uh, if there is the evidence that the jet passed because uh, we did see that in the cross section that all of a sudden the winds drop. So now we are looking, we're looking west southwest here. The more mezzo is on the right side. You can see the different colors, the reds and the blues together. That's the more mezzo. But then five miles to the south, to the left, there looks like there's a speed max of some sort there in the flow. This little blue area right around 10,000 feet. Uh, or below, a little bit below, 10, about five to 10,000 feet. So what happens to that? Let's see what happens. Okay, so it's still there. And again, the me more, more meso is five miles away. So this is definitely not being, in, the meso is not impacting it here. This is something else that's not associated with the more storm. There's a speed max there, but then watch what happens. All of a sudden, winds drop by about 20 knots all of a sudden below 10,000 feet. We don't have anything ab above 50 knots really um, in below 10,000 feet anymore. It just all of a sudden, just whatever was there just passed. And so it even is in the next few scans, it, the winds even weaken more. So we're definitely think we are seeing a 700 millibar jet that came through about the time before the tornado developed and then all the way through toward the end of the tornado. And we are, we are proposing that there was a meso beta scale 700 millibar jet of about 60 to 80 knots. It was about eight or so miles wide, roughly and about 30 miles long. We've seen these kind of jet structures at 850 millibars. They're pretty common. Is it possible that this was something uh, similar at 700 millibars that came out of the southwest and so we think that 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 is what happened here if you look at the 17 z norman sounding on may 20th 2013 the 0 to 3 srh was about 150 0 to 1 srh was about 135 0 to 6 was about 50. And look at your photograph it's got this it's it's curved but it's not it doesn't it's not that large but what if you add the winds from that feature that we saw, which increased the winds anywhere from 20 to 30 knots. So over here to the lower right is what we modified the sounding. Um, and so we decreased it the most at 700 millibars, millibars, which was showed up in the base velocity data, uh, anywhere from you know, 10 knots at low levels to about 30 knots at 700. So now our photograph there is long looped and the zero to three goes up to 400, zero to one SRH goes up to about 320, and the zero to six is about 60 knots. So the shear profile became much more favorable. And this here looks like a violent tornado sounding. Uh, whereas if we look at this one, this one, you would not necessarily expect a violent tornado. Uh, this one, you certainly would. So I think that these features uh, maybe um, happen. Uh, they are probably rare, but anyway, so now we're going to look at um, what happened more on the storm scale. We're going to look at the cell mergers that happened and then the DRCs that were, that were, that developed. This is a cross section looking east, northeast, and it's right along the track of the cell mergers that happened and the, the first DRC that was involved in, in the, the development of the tornado initially. And so that's the, that's the track of the cross section. So we see the more flanking line precipitation there to the left, this little wedge shape. That's the flanking line of the more storm. And that would be the pendant, but behind the flanking line, we see a cell develop there. It grows up scale and a second cell, that little second cell back to the furthest uh, that one there, the second one is going to grow, also grow up scale. But the first one, you can see that it's approaching the more flanking line. There's still some separation there. 
And then the second one really grows up scale and you can see that's that long yellow area of, that's cell two. The cell one now has got a red core, but it has not merged with the more flanking line, which is a bit further uh, to the right in the cross section. There's still a gap between the two. And then those, the cell one and cell two, they merge. And then they still have not merged into the more flanking line, which is this wedge shape here uh, that's sort of toward the middle of the cross section. And then the two cells, they have another wedge shape that's to the left of that. And then this cell merger into the flanking line occurs. So we had this first cell merger of one and two. Now we have those two that, that have already merged together. They're merging with the flanking line. And on this next uh, frame, we're gonna see that they have now merged with the flanking line. So those two cells now are in the supercell's flanking line. And then from there, the decenium reflectivity core, DRC1, this develops here and it comes out of that cell merger. And at this point, it's uh, a small, but we can follow it down to the surface. And we found that in our study of supercells, uh, the DRCs don't have to be that large. They can be small, but they uh, are associated with stronger winds that can help the RFD occlusion to sort of get going enough for a tornado to form. It makes it easier for the cyclone to develop a tornado. And this one here is going to descend. We'll watch it descend to the surface. The next scan, this is about nine minutes before the tornado here. But then see how this little, uh, this little core here, it does drop gradually. And at this point, we're 30 seconds away from the tornado. The DRC has this gap uh, just above the surface. So it, it hasn't completely gone to the surface yet. It is on the ground further to the west as we see the yellows that are now at the surface, but there's this gap. And so when the DRC hits the RFD occlusion and it's just gonna zipper down across, that's when the tornado developed. So the DRC provided something extra, a little boost to be able to get the mesocyclone to produce the tornado. The timing was just right for the Moore storm. And so that DRC becomes absorbed into the tornado. Now we're gonna take a look at the second descending reflectivity core that impacted the Moore storm. And it did, it moved in after the tornado. And so we're looking at a cross section, looking Northwest. And the tornado is gonna go through the cross section. And if you notice here, See, DRC, the storm that was associated with DRC2 is about to become a DRC at this point, and it is now, and it's merging into the more storm, merging into the tornado, and then wraps around the tornado. We're going to watch this in the cross section. So right now we're out uh, about 22 minutes before the tornado. We're going to watch as the storm that was associated with DRC2 approaches, and then it's going to become the, as soon as we see our DRC2, that's when it's initiated and it's going to drop. So we see DRC2, uh, the cells that were uh, associated with DRC2 approaching, and then DRC2 is going to initiate, and we're going to see it in the cross section right there. And, and it has just formed. It is going to descend quickly toward the tornado and then wrap around the tornado. We'll see it there is an outflow boundary associated with that convective complex that's going to shoot across the inflow sector of, this, of the Moore storm and cut off the inflow channel. And so we see DRC2 in front of, just above the tornado at that point. Now it's going to wrap around the backside and then become absorbed. And I'll let you look at that again. So there's DRC2. And then it dives down and wraps around the tornado and then is absorbed. Well, what happened to that outflow boundary that was associated with it? It uh, gradually blocked off the inflow channel right there. And so that caused an expansion of the mesocyclone at the surface. And if you look at the base velocity image here, you see the, the, uh, the meso and it's, it's the blues and the, and the reds. Uh, it's a very uh, well, a strong meso with a, with a, with a strong tornado, a high end tornado already, but it has not reached EF5 status at this point. Now, if we look at uh, what happened when DRC2 came, so if we look right here, at this point, 
the, the DRC2 what goes around the tornado and also the outflow shoots across the inflow sector and the meso rapidly expands. If you notice, look, that it's mostly the northern edge of the northern part of the meso, the reds. On the top there, look at look at how they expand. Uh, they they basically double about double. Those reds double in about one volume in one volume scan, and so that's DRC two that's that's causing the, the surface meso to stretch out as it's trying to strengthen, but this stretching causes the meso diameter to rapidly expand. And then once DRC two is absorbed into the circulation and it's not having an impact anymore on this next scan we see that the meso rapidly shrinks uh, back to a compact structure. And then even on the next scan, it, it shrinks even more. So what happened is in two scans, it went from an expanded, uh, stretched out meso in the horizontal sense. And then all of a sudden in two scans, it just rapidly shrunk. Well, this is the time that it went to EF5 uh, right here. This was about to become EF5 and right here it's it's already produced its ef5 damage and it's like a skater who is trying to is slows down because they put their arms out in the spin and then all of a sudden they pull their arms in and they increase the uh the the, the rapid spin rate by pulling all their their weight in uh into their body and so that's what happens with these with these violent tornadoes we, we've seen this before you know, uh, a study we did in 2002 showed that this this process is pretty common with violent tornadoes. Uh, this seems to be a common process. It's not a rare process. Uh, and so this is when the Moore storm reached EF5 intensity. And uh, it was at its strongest point and widest if you consider both of those metrics together. So then we're going to look at a planar view and we're going to put all of these things we've been talking about, the RFD surges, cell mergers, the DRCs, and all this together on the reflectivity. So there's the Moore storm. Okay, so we have the first two cells that developed, and then the mesocyclone is ahead of those cells. And so those cells are, are kind of developing at this point. You can see the first one, the, the green, and then the second green one. They're a light reflectivity course, but they're big updrafts. And they're west of the meso, but then we're going to see the cell merger right there. They begin to merge. There, the RFD boundary is becoming established, and it's starting to push underneath the meso. And you see the forward flank downdraft boundary there. Then the cell merger continues to go, uh, continues to to um, those cells continue to come together as the RFD boundary begins to move under the meso. Then the DRC forms from the cell merger there. You can see the little red core inside there. And the RFD occlusion in O is shown there. And the DRC1, the first DRC, will go approach the, the RFD occlusion. The RFD surge, first RFD surge is ongoing. And so the RFD surge is moving toward the forward flank here. You can see the forward flank downdraft boundary and you see the inflow channel that's starting to, to form there. And so what's happening is, is the, the updraft is evacuating air aloft and the air is being forced through that narrow inflow channel and not enough air can get down below. So the surface flow rapidly deepens and the RFD occlusion starts to really form. And so also down here uh, in the bottom part of the picture, we see the second descending reflectivity cord that's approaching. Um, so DRC1. And we have DRC, well, this is not a DRC. I want to make that clear. This is not a DRC yet, but this is the storm that's associated with the RC2. And it's got an outflow boundary that's going to push across the inflow sector. And the first uh, DRC now is wrapping into the RFD occlusion and tornado forms. So as the first DRC hit the RFD occlusion, as we saw in the cross section, the tornado formed. The inflow channel now has developed. We see that the outflow boundary associated with what is now DRC2, that is going to come across the inflow check, uh, the inflow sector and cut off the inflow channel completely right there. The inflow channel is completely blocked. The surface mesocyclone is stretched out. 
it's it's beginning to stretch out now um, and then the rfd surge 2 is underway which was instigated by the second drc then in one volume scan the meso rapidly shrinks the inflow channel becomes re-established um, just right away and then the tornado intensifies to ef5 and so it was just a, one of those processes. We talked about the process, uh, but um, it happened very quickly. And so after that, we have spiral banding. And this is for, uh, this is actually debris, debris ejections that are occurring from the tornado. Uh, so you have this spiral banding structure. We're, we're gonna see, I'm gonna look, uh, show you more of that later on. Then um, the RFD surge, th the third RFD surge is out, and then the tornado, that affects the tornado, a cold and uh, stable RFD, in a relative sense, uh, wipe this, wipes the tornado out. So let's take a look at this on base velocity. So we have the, the more mesocyclone, it's actually the RFD occlusion, you can see it's, it's gonna develop right, right here. Now, so as you see the RFD, it's the RFD occlusion is this green and this little small little red. Uh, there's a couplet that it's developing and then out ahead of that is the RFD surge. That's the first RFD surge. You can see that little long green area. Um, it's a small, but it's a little thing that's coming out. That's the beginning of the RFD surge. The RFD occlusion now intensifies, it develops and intensifies. And then the first RFD surge, you can see it right there. You can see the leading edge of the RFD surge now moving toward the forward flank and the RFD occlusion now is con continuing to strengthen. Now we see the presence of DRC1 and wind speeds really increase uh, within the RFD occlusion on the south side associated with the DRC. The inflow channel develops, you see the red, uh, this little long extended area and then it wraps into the circulation. That's the inflow channel forming. Uh, the tornado is forming at this point. Uh, it's about 16 seconds literally from the tornado start time. The RFD surge one is still ongoing. Now the tornado is developing and it's becoming very strong uh, as well as the inflow channel, which you can see wrapping into the circulation. The inflow channel has now made a strong connection to the tornado. And the RFD surge one continues and you can see this, uh, this wedge shape that extends all the way out toward the forward flank in the green. Now, what happened when DRC2 came? It drove a wedge across the inflow channel. See, the inflow channel now is cut off. The inflow channel is completely blocked by this, this green wedge of air. And you can see that's the, the northern part of the circulation associated with the tornado, the little red area, is now cut off from the other reds across in the inflow sector. And then the second RFD surge really gets going, and you can see the RFD boundary vortices, they're like gustinados that form along the RFD boundary. The inflow channel has now reopened at this point. If you go up in elevation, which we don't show here, you can definitely see the inflow channel really strongly established a few seconds from this point, and the F5 tornado is forming. It's, it's, it, the tornado is actually intensifying to EF5 at this point. And then the RFD surge tube continues the third RFD surge shows up there. You can see the little spike of greens coming out. That's the third RFD surge that just killed the tornado. So now we're going to look at the Hendron animation of the Moore EF5 supercell. We're about a, uh, we're 90 minutes uh, before the tornado start time. We're in a helicopter at 15,000 feet. We're looking north northwest. But a few things before we look at the animation. The animation. Um, took approximately 3,000 hours to develop. It was a pandemic project. You know, we looked at 208 tornadic supercells that produced high-end tornadoes, and we got averages, start times, end times for RFD surges and DRCs and different things uh, associated with tornado genesis. We looked at uh, the SVC and the cell mergers, for, for instance. Uh, but then, during the pandemic, we stopped the radar analysis and identified, um, we were just looking at the averages that we had established at that point and drew an animation to show those averages. But during that process, we thought it would be really cool if we could find a storm that is close to the average 
that we could draw into the animation. And this is this animation that you're going to see is drawn for the Moore storm using the radar that we showed you to draw those things that happen on the radar into the animation and make it match it to radar to make it as accurate as possible. We found that Moore was representative of Tornado Genesis and it was in our database very close to the database average. And so this was a difficult project to undertake, but we had to put a lot of detail into it to make sure it was as accurate as possible, not claiming that everything is perfect, uh, but we've done our best to try to match it to radar as closely as possible. And so we're gonna show you that today. We're gonna look at the animation. And so we're looking north, northwest here, and we're going to, and the helicopter is going to gradually shift to more of a westerly view as the storm develops. It's gonna be on the left side on the horizon. Now, another few other things about the animation. There's gonna be radar images that show up on the right-hand corner, the upper right-hand corner, radar images, uh, base velocity measurements, uh, like the surface wind was derived from, um, if you want to know how some of these uh, uh, velocity data on the upper right, when you see the animation later on, you can read the paper. It explains how those uh, speeds were derived. Um, there, the 700 millibar wind, for instance, is, is gonna show. And um, there's also things like CAPE, which was estimated based on uh, the sounding. Uh, and then also, uh, down in the lower right, you're gonna see an insert of the tornado. It's gonna show more detail. And so what I want you to do this first time is just Enjoy the animation, try to absorb it, and then we'll, on the second pass, I'll go and explain everything that's going on. But here's the, the animation. Again, 90 minutes before the tornado, looking north-northwest, it's gonna to shift to more of a westerly view, and it's gonna go through the entire tornado life cycle. So here we go. So the more storm is gonna develop oh, upper left there on the horizon. The animal forms. And as a cyclone forms, now it's a supercell and it's got a meso that's descending to low levels. There's the cells that we saw in the cross section. Then the RFD surge, DRC first, and then we got the tornado that forms. Second DRC, and then the second RFD surge, and then the third RFD surge, and then tornado is over. So that's the first, that's the first pass through. The second pass, we're gonna look at the different processes and we're gonna go through slower and I'm gonna show you how this matches the radar of what we saw. Okay, first of all, Anvil develops. At this point, <clears throat> that 700 millibar mesobeta jet that we talked about has not gotten to the more storm. So it's just a strong supercell at this point. It's a developing supercell, but it's not really rotating as strongly yet. And you can see that in the flanking line, there's uh, not a real strong evidence of, um, the whole storm has not wrapped up yet. And it really hasn't become super strong yet, although it's, it's organized at this point. But then we had to see the two cells that we saw in the cross section, those merge, okay? Remember it had not merged into the flanking line. When the first merger happened of the two cells, it was not in the flanking line yet. And so these are some of the um, you know, things that are labeled here, the forward flank downdraft boundary, the RFD boundary, and we have the meso beta seven, scale 700 millibar jet back to the Southwest. It's just approaching the more updraft at this point. Again, 60 to 80 knots. But if you look at the 700 millibar wind speed, which was measured four degrees from the meso two nautical miles to the Southeast of the meso, uh, the, the elevation angle was at four degrees. The estimated wind was 46.2 knots. So we have the 700 mile bar jet that's approaching, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And this is before the tornado by about 16 minutes. So what happens when the 700 mile bar jet, it hits the flanking line right as the cell merger is producing uh, the outflow that's gonna get the RFD surge going, the first RFD surge. You see the RFD surge is being pulled around from the main core via the outflow associated with the cell merger. 
But then the 700 millibar jet uh, hits at that time. Right now, 700 millibar winds have now up to 52 knots. And then those winds kind of converge. There's a convergence. And then the RFD surge really surges out 700 millibar wind up to 58 knots. And then the RFD surge really gets going. 700 millibar winds up to 63 knots. And a lot of the air is getting pulled, pushed in, actually it's funneled down. It's kind of like uh, pulled down into the RFD surge. And that really gets uh, the RFD surge toward the forward flank here. And it's, it now has gone underneath the mesocyclone. And then the winds are starting to, um, um, there's, there's some convergence now between the RFD boundary and the forward flank boundary. And now the 700 millibar wind speeds are up to 72 knots. And the GRC1 there is now uh, embedded into the flanking line, that core. And it's gonna just gradually drop the RFD occlusion now is, 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 is you see the circu circular area underneath the meso. That's the RFD occlusion. Now if we go back just a little bit, see the RFD occlusion developed right here. And it developed right near the boundary and then moved southwestward relative to the RFD boundary. Well, kind of like west-southwestward relative to the RFD boundary. So it got deeper back in. And that's just because the RFD boundary is surging away from it. And so... At this point, the inflow channel is starting to develop. And one thing I want you to notice, this is about four minutes before the tornado start time. If we look over here in the lower right insert, when the inflow channel gets going, so does the SVC. And we found that there's a relationship between the two. It's because winds in the inflow channel approximately double according to our measurements over the winds that are in the inflow, uh, inflow region of the supercell. And so the winds are really funneled in through this inflow channel, which really gets the SVC cranking, which you see over here on the right insert. Another thing too, is that as the DRC, the first DRC, which we see here in the flanking line to the left of the meso, as it uh, descends to the ground, it pulls more precipitation and airflow from the main supercell around the mesocyclone. And the mesocyclone sort of dragged down with it but the um, occlusion downdraft, which is the darker grays in the insert here, and then the lighter grays just to the left of it are the first DRC, they kind of inter work together and they descend toward the surface and hit the surface uh, about two minutes before right here is about when DRC1 is at the surface. And so we're not saying that this is descending toward energogenesis at all. What we're saying is that the DRC is now on the ground at this point and it is now moving sideways along the ground toward the RFD occlusion. And notice right here, the occlusion downdraft and the DRC. This is just about 37 seconds before the tornado start time. And both of those features are, the, the, the focus is in the lowest couple hundred meters right near, near the RFD occlusion. So it is now getting to the RFD occlusion. It's about to wrap into it, but it's concentrated at the low level. So we're looking at a tornado that developed really from the surface up or all, all at once. I mean, it, it, it's hard to say um, without more detailed analysis of high resolution radar, but we're definitely saying that this was, this was all focused right at, this, at the surface RF, RFD occlusion. And so right there is when it wraps into the tornado. This is the tornado start time. And so, so why does the funnel appear to descend? Well, our, our hypothesis is that the funnel forms along the, the nose of this wedge of air associated with the occlusion downdraft and the uh, DRC. And so there's a pressure deficit that forms just behind the nose of this wedge of air, which then pulls the funnel cloud down. But the, the actual uh, tornado develops at the ground, and then there's this stretching component that we see in the insert. So, so the air is pulled upward and stretched, and you can see that, and this tornado developed very rapidly, which is a sign of incredible organization. Um, the features were very timed, timed well. Uh, the 700 millibar jet was a, definitely a player. And so now the SVC has fully developed, the occlusion downdraft, which we believe is a semi-steady permanent, it was a semi-steady feature in these high-end storms. And the DRC then 
you know, it gets absorbed into the tornado, but the occlusion downdraft is still there. And, um, and our proposal is that these, uh, the, the, the occlusion downdraft is, is important. Um, and um, at this point, the tornado is becoming rapidly wider. And the second, uh, you can see the uh, second DRC2 there, basically the, the second DRC is approaching the tornado at this point. At this point, the, the tornado is maximum width at 1.1 miles, nautical miles wide. And DRC2 is about to hit the tornado. Um, and so if we back up a little bit, we see that DRC2 came out of this, this cluster of cells uh, from, from, the, from the south southwest. And you can see in the radar image, just in the insert here, those cells become DRC2. It becomes DRC2 now. Um, and then the outflow boundary associated with these cells push, pushes across the inflow sector. And then it makes this long um, inflow channel. But then DRC2 descends to the ground right there and then comes in and it, see it stretches out the surface mesocyclone and then the inflow channel is cut off. And so when we see the inflow channel cut off like that, notice in the insert, the SVC diminishes. So let's go back and look at that one more time. So the, the DRC comes in, it has a, a strong wind speeds with it. Um, and then it causes the surface mesocyclone to stretch out. And then the inflow channel all of a sudden opens up again and the tornado boosts up the EF5. And this is when we had the rapid contraction of the RFD uh, and the surface mesocyclone. You can see, okay, so here's when it was at, at, at its widest. And then the north side just really expanded, I mean, expanded and then contracted. So at this point, it just contracted by uh, 40 to 50% is an estimation. Uh, the meso shrunk by about 40% but possibly even at the surface, a little bit more. And then that's when it was at EF5 and it was at the maximum width when it was at EF5 at 0.8 nautical miles, which is close to a mile wide um, statute, a mile st wide in statute miles. But then the RFD boundary also has these RFD vortices, uh, these RFD boundary vortices. So they're like gusts and natives that form along the RFD boundary. And that's because the, the, the second RFD surge and then the inflow strengthened both of those things. The, 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 the downdraft air was coming at you and the inflow air is, is going away from you. And those two created strong convergence along the RFD boundary to get these little vortices. Well, notice uh, also the 700 millibar jet is still impacting the storm. And, and, and if we back up even more, let's just back up real quick. So when the, when the 700 millibar jet hit the storm, watch what happens to the flanking line. You can see these, the convection really organized. And then you start to see the area go around with the updrafts um, convective towers. You see it's just rotating there. And so that was because the flow increased so dramatically. And the storm is just rotating like a top right here. But then watch what happens when the 700 mile bar jet passes. Okay, so all of a sudden, right after that, there there's not as much flow. So... Precipitation uh, gets, starts to come down from higher up, and the third RFD surge comes from, from higher up in the storm. It's more co cool and more stable, and then comes down, hits the ground, and then kills the tornado. And so another thing to look at, when the 700 millibar jet passed, so here's the 700 millibar jet. It passes right here. Notice there's a jog in the track. Uh, the tornado turns before the jet passed, it turns sharply northeast, and then after it passes, it jogs to the southeast. And then the tornado becomes narrow. So definitely, it isn't a uh, coincidence, we don't think, that, that the tornado uh, did it, uh, uh, jogged so sharply right when the jet passed. The winds dramatically changed that were impacting the storm, and so that's the reason why there was a jog in the track. Another thing too is that I, I told you that the there were those debris ejections, the, the spiral banding, which you can see over here in the reflectivity of just above the insert to the right. Uh, these these uh, ejections, um, these were these uh, did cause the spiral banding. We've drawn that in here to to be accurate to the radar. And so when the tornado dissipated. It did show this loop. This was actually in the observations of the tornado. We did see a loop structure uh, just before it dissipated. 
And so that is an explanation of the animation. I'm going to show you the animation one last time and we're going to just enjoy it. Uh, this was done in an effort to continue the, uh, the history of schematics that have done in, been done in the weather community. We've had a history of excellent schematics within the uh, weather community. And, and so this is just an attempt to continue that tradition. As we go, we're going to watch this. I just want to let you enjoy this. And we were all kids and we love this stuff. And it just kind of draws the, the excitement out of you. You can find the Tornado Genesis papers on the SBC website under Publications Conference Papers, or you can go to the links below. Thank you for watching.